Queerness is about breaking rules and conventions, challenging the norms and throwing them back in people's faces. It's also about looking fabulous. If you can't see the back, I'm wearing yellow and blue nail varnish today, just so you know. Uh, more formally, I've been a game journalist for the past 10 years, and I'm now moving into the other side of games by writing for them. Uh, I'll be talking about how we can make games even more queer. And as a heads up, I will be talking about sex, nothing too explicit. And there will be a slight mention of suicide later on. Uh, right. So we're here now in 2020 with two of the main actors in a Star Wars film publicly upset that they didn't get to gay kiss on camera. Uh, with the highest grossing animated film ever, Frozen 2, hinting that a star Elsa may have a girlfriend. And this year we'll have the first Marvel film with an openly gay superhero. Uh, and that film is The Eternals, by the way, which is fitting because queer love is eternal, as you can see from this typical exchange on Grindr. <laughs> Uh, queer people have been fighting for years for mainstream visibility and acceptance. And look at where we are now. We have Elton John and Freddie Mercury biopics, a pansexual main character in Netflix's Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, and gay icon Ruby Rose is playing a gay as hell cat woman on TV. We did it, you know, great. So what should we do now? Just march back home with our iced coffees and just talk about the rainbow color poop emoji all day? Nah, -uh, I don't think so. Uh, we should consider why queer representation is the hottest it's ever been right now. It seems everyone's trying to get LGBTQAI characters in their stories these days. And why are this to make us queers happy or to make money? Yes, it's inevitable in our society that anything cool and popular will be commodified eventually. It doesn't matter how anti-consumerist it may be. <clears throat> Just look at what happened to punk fashion and graffiti. Which is why we now have Rainbow capitalism! <laughs> this is when companies wear rainbow colors to show uh, queer support, but not always actually doing anything to support us. And why? Well, it's obvious. They do this to get queer people on their side and to encourage them to buy their products. And sometimes it works. I myself am guilty of buying something just because it has a rainbow flag on it. Uh, bet you do too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not always that cute though. In fact, commodification rarely is. Most of the time, it's just ridiculous. Uh, to illustrate just how ridiculous it can be, I want to introduce you to one of my favorite activities. All you have to do is type into Google, in quotation marks, you can now buy, and switch it to the news tab and see what great new products are hitting the headlines. For example, you can now buy, are you ready for this? A mini tub for your testicles. A mini hot tub, sorry, for your testicles. Uh, unfortunately, the 24 karat gold one is sold out, so sorry. Um, you can also now buy a hyper-realistic mask of your pet, which isn't, you know, creepy at all. Uh, you can now buy a Valentine's fish and chip bouquet to share with your loved one. Nothing more romantic than a of hot grease and fish stink. Um, you can now buy a koala dildo to support victims of the Australian bushfires. Uh, I will be providing notes for this talk, so if you want to save the koalas, you know what to do. Uh, you may also remember that someone recently bought a banana duct tape to the wall for £92,000. It's art, keep up. Um, after it was sold, and I absolutely love this, this man just straight up ate it in front of everyone. Um, I just love how much he doesn't give a shit. Um, commodification, as we've just, commodification, as we've just seen, can be ridiculous. It causes companies to jump on the latest trend and try to appeal to a target audience in all sorts of outlandish, way, outlandish ways. At best, it's silly and fun, but at worst, it's outright offensive. We have to be ultra aware of this going forward as we'll see more and more queer representation that doesn't have a good motive behind it. We need more queer products and media made by queer people. But what I want to focus on here is how crucially we also need to focus on getting across the experience, uh, queer experience. Um, so now I'm gonna show you something that may seem silly, but I will explain why it's not. Here it is. It's the buy chair for people who can't sit straight. Um, apparently queer people can't sit on a chair properly. <laughs> Uh-huh. Um, as well myself, I can confirm, confirm this is true. There's just arms and legs everywhere. Um, as silly as this by chair may seem, it's actually a pretty good example of how to handle queer design. The creator took an existing idea, in this case a chair, and changed it to fit queer behavior. Not many supposed queer products do this, they're just an aesthetic, or they use stereotype as their basis, or rather than actually finding out what queer people want and how to improve their lives. Um, we all probably know this is as, as if you look at queer representation in the media over the years, it's pretty obvious how bad it is. If I was to demonstrate just how bad by using the buy chair as an example, 
um, I would have to glue a dildo to the seat, uh, cover it in rainbows, and have anyone who sits in it slapped around to the sound of canned laughter. Uh, for years, queer people only existed in a lot of media as the butts of horribly offensive jokes, or as sex objects for people to gawk at. But it has improved recently, especially in my field of expertise, which is video games. That might be because more queer people, queer people now work in video games, specifically uh, than most, more than most of other media industries. A few weeks ago, the first ever UK games industry census came out. It reports that 21% of people in the game industry identify as LGBTQIA+. That's significantly higher than the last uh, known national percentage of queer people in the UK, which is just 2% in 2017. And current estimates are about th uh, three to seven percent. Uh, conclusion: A lot of people, uh, a lot of queer people, are attracted to video games, which might be why we've have lots of small games made by queer people, as well as significant increase in bigger games that feature queer characters in a positive light. Uh, with that being the case, it's important for us to come together and figure out how we can represent queerness even in be even better in games. Broadly speaking, these days, queerness in games is handled in one of three ways. First is the games that let you play with queer romance. Think of your Mass Effects and The Sims, in which you can choose to pursue queer hookups, but you don't have to, it's just an option. Second are the games that normalize queerness by blending it into the background of a larger world. An example of this can be found in The Last of Us, as you can pick up clues in the environment that reveal their characters Bill and Frank are gay lovers. This is never explicitly said anywhere else in the game, you just have to kind of find it yourself. Um, and third are the games that put queer characters and experiences front and center. This includes the like of Gone Home, Night in the Woods, and this game, Dream Daddy, a dad dating simulator. The main characters in these games are outright queer, and there's no mistaking it. Uh, looking to the future, it seems like we'll have many more games that fall into this third category, uh, which, with one of the most important coming out this year being a game called Tell Me Why. It will be the first game from a major studio with a trans character as its star, and that character is even being voiced by a trans person. This is a big step up for queer and specifically trans representation in media, and one that's been due for a while. Hopefully, the people at Don't Not Entertainment making Tell Me Why do a good job of it. They've been working with GLAAD, which is the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, to make this an authentic representation of the trans experience, so fingers crossed. Uh, if this is the direction we're going with queer games, it's something we need more of is queer game design. We need to go beyond simply draping queerness over pre-existing designs and come up with new ones that have been tailor-made to relay the queer experience. This is something that one of the great queer academics, Colleen Macklin, has brought up in the past. Uh, talking about same-sex romance options in games, she says, what if, instead of a simple variable switch in the code, there were options not just for the gender, of the person or alien we might woo, but the way we woo them. It's laudable that these same-sex romance options exist, but do they represent a game gay wash, promising LGBTQI options, but with little flexibility in our actual play? What she's saying here is that the fact that queer representation exists at all is good, but in some games, it's only surface level. It doesn't go further than changing a pronoun, a name, or a bit of art. We need to go further and hard code queerness into games. This is the next step for queer game design. To get across why this is important in the most crude way possible, because that's what I'm all about, uh, think about the mechanics of straight sex, what, which are what, you know, like penetration, thrusting, whatever. Applying these mechanics to queer sex isn't always going to work. There isn't always a penis, sometimes there isn't any, any nudity, and for asexual people, sex can be purely emotional rather than physical. It wouldn't be possible to represent the sheer variety of queer sex solely with the mechanics of heterosexual sex, so we need to invent new ones. So what does queer game design look like? That's what I'm here to show you. So let's go through a few different examples of queer game design that already exist and that are successful in what they try to convey. <clears throat> First up is Realistic Kissing Simulator. Uh, it's a cooperative game about kissing meant for two players. The players share a single keyboard between them, being assigned two buttons each, and from there try to kiss each other with their long, thick tongues. Uh, but before that, both players have to agree to kiss one another. And if one of them doesn't agree, then the game cannot be played. Uh, the queerness of Realistic Kissing Simulator may seem obvious at first. The two characters on screen don't have any dis discernible gender, and the fact you have to agree to kiss the other person first is reflective of the increased awareness and importance of consent that it tends to exist in queer communities. Bo Ruberg, the author of Video Games Have Always Been Queer, which was just read out now, uh, goes further and argues that the game has several layers of queerness. Bo says that the goallessness of Realistic Kissing Simulator makes it even more queer. How? Bo, uh, Realistic kiss, uh, Kissing Simulator destabilizes the assumption that video games, and by extension sex or other intimate contact, should have a win state or even a pre-prescribed ending. 
There's no way to win a uh, realistic kissing simulator. That means it's up to the players to decide when it's over. This becomes especially interesting when observing straight people of the same gender play the game, as it opens up a homoerotic play between them, which is amplified by the intimate physical space that they share due to having to have uh, the same keyboard. The two players can lick each other's eyes, nostrils, and shove their tongue into each other's throats. It might be that two straight players find this level of virtual intimacy with a person of the same gender uncomfortable. And so the game will probably end when one of them can't take the tension any longer. At this point, they have had a queer experience due to the game's design. They may now know what it feels like to discuss people simply for being a queer couple in public. Maybe they come away from the game questioning their own sexuality. Uh, if nothing else, they have had experience uh, of one of the challenges of queer sex. As realistic kissing simulator doesn't have closure, both players need to decide on when to finish, just like queer people having sex that doesn't have an obvious endpoint like an orgasm. Uh, this forces players of the game to come up with their own goals so that they know when the endpoint might be. This means communicating with each other in ways that straight sex doesn't always demand. Realistic Kissing Simulator's queer game design then is in, it, is in its goallessness and the physical space that it has players occupy when playing. Right, next up is the Tea Room, which is a public bathroom sex simulator, I said there'd be a lot of sex, made by Robert Yang, who is a gay man who makes games about the gay man experience. <laughs> it starts with you looking down a urinal that you're pissing into. Once you're done flicking bits of pee everywhere, which everyone does, you'll probably start looking around the room. That's all you can do at first is piss and look around. So you stand there and wait. Sooner or later, you'll hear a vehicle pull up outside and a man will come into the bathroom and start pissing into a urinal next to you. Now, what do you do? The only way you can interact with this world is to look around. So you'll probably look over at him. Some men will ignore you, but there are others who will look back at you. It's a bold move. Two men in a public toilet returning the male gaze back at each other as they empty their bladders. If you hold that gaze, a bar slowly fills up, this one, uh, and you may have to look back at the man a few times in order for that bar to complete, be completely full. Once it is, the man will walk over to you, you get on your knees, and you proceed to lick his gun, um, which actually feeds into the larger politics behind the game, which I won't go into now, but you should look into in your own time if you're interested. Uh, my focus here is on how Robert quiz the simple game mechanic of looking around. Typically, looking around in a first-person game comes with a certain amount of power. You look at environments or objects that don't return your gaze. Or you're holding a gun in your hand and are actually aiming at enemies to shoot and kill, which is supposed to be the ultimate power fantasy. In the tea room, the powerful male gaze is reflected back at you, and by maintaining it, you are silently agreeing to enter into a gay sexual act. Whether you know you're agreeing to a gay sexual act or not probably depends on your identity. Many women will know that some men think if you return their stare, then that gives them permission to do what the hell they want with you, which is pretty awful. But the dynamic is a little different when it's two queer men who are returning each other's gaze. This has become a vital part of the silent communication that has emerged over the years in the gay community. That moment of returning the gaze is how men in previous years, when being gay wasn't as acceptable, told each other in public that they were interested. Communicating that out loud could have gotten beaten up or potentially even imprisoned. So, that had, so they had to be subtle. By simply looking at each other, they both knew it was on. And they did that without alerting anyone else to their intentions. The tea room takes this a little further as well. Uh, while you're playing, you have to keep a constant lookout for the police, especially when you're down on your knees as your back is to the window that overlooks the car park. If the police arrive and, you ca and you're caught you know, doing what you're doing, they arrest you and you lose the game. So looking around in the tea room isn't just a way for gay men to give consent to each other, it's a vital part of how they survive in a world that doesn't accept them. It packs queer history and interactions into what is usually an insignificant interaction in games, which is looking around. And by doing that, the game is able to communicate a specific queer experience. Uh, right, next up is, we're gonna look at two games and how they queer the act of driving. The first is called Roundabout. It's a bit like Crazy Taxi, if you've ever played that, um, in which you have to pick up passengers and take them to their destination as fast as possible. Um, the difference is that you have to drive a limousine that is constantly spinning in, a, spinning in a circle. As you drive forward, the limousine rotates on an axis, which means you have to be very, very careful to not hit everything in sight. Uh, I didn't think the game was actually that queer when I first played it until I got to the end because the limousine driver actually hooks up with one of her passengers. Um, it's very cute. And uh, knowing the main character was queer made me reconsider what the game was about and particularly how it gets uh, meaning across on a design level through that spinning limousine. 
driving in a roundabout is really difficult. It's hard to even move in a straight line. Uh, other than obviously saying that you are not driving straight in the game, the difficulty of moving through the city reflects the queer experience. Your car is different to everyone else's. It doesn't engage in the normal mode of transportation. Much like the way queer people's identities and bodies don't conform to ideas of normality. This also makes getting around the city and public space much harder. Queer people sometimes face a dilemma at gendered public toilets whenever they are asked for ID or may even be targeted for abuse for wearing the clothes that they want to. Just like in Roundabout, queer people have to learn how to navigate those everyday problems, as it's, not just in a, it's, not, it's just not in us to drive straight, to fall in line with what's considered normal and acceptable. Uh, the second game is another one by Robert Yang called Stick Shift. It's about having sex with your car, but not in the way you might assume. Uh, you do so through what are typical interactions for a driving game. Uh, just if you are playing a racing game, you use the accelerator to rev your car and have to time your gear changes correctly in order to reach higher speeds. But you're not trying to reach a finish line as such, you're trying to reach top gear and top revs. Uh, acceleration in this case is equated to sexual excitement, which means when you eventually hit the top speed, you and the car reach the point of orgasm, which is indicated by this image of liquid dripping from its exhaust pipe. Oh, and so the whole time when you're doing this, uh, to really drive home the gay sex imagery, you're just pumping the gear stick like this the whole time. Uh, once again, Robert goes further than this and infuses his game with a moment inspired by a certain event in queer history. There's a 48% chance of being interrupted during your car sex by two armed policemen. They force you to stop, at which point you have to choose how to react. Either you can go quietly and feel shunned for your sexual deviancy, or you can make kissy faces at the policemen, which Yang describes as denying their authority through flamboyance, just as queer people did when facing the cops during the 1969 Stonewall riots. They made out in front of the cops who were trying to shut them down, using gay expression as a form of protest, and at the same time absolutely humiliating the New York police. The reason there's a specifically a 48% chance of the cops showing up in stick shift is to reference a 2015 Williams Institute report, which states that of the LGBT violence survivors who were interacted with police, 48% reported they had experienced police misconduct. Here, Yang uses the element of random chance within the system to reflect a part of queer reality. Which leads me to my next example, and you'll never guess it. Have a go. No. Minecraft. Uh, would you believe me if I told you that Minecraft has one of the best examples of queer reproduction? It's true. It's uh, something that Amanda Phillips outlines in the book Understanding Minecraft. Hopefully we all, know what, we all know what Minecraft is. It's a game that generates worlds that each have a unique algorithm and there's pretty much billions of them. None of them are the same. You try to survive in the world you spawn in by digging up blocks of resources that can be turned into weapons, shelter, appliances, and much more. You have to eat to survive too, so you can forage for berries and hunt for animals for their meat. But Minecraft isn't a realistic game, but it does borrow elements from the real world and turns them into game mechanics, one of which is breeding. It's possible to tame animals and to get them to have offspring. But Minecraft's method of breathing deviates from how we understand it to work in our world, as Amanda Phillips explains. The operator can initiate breeding in any two domesticated animals of the same species by finding, finding them their favorite food, a rather curious design decision that associates reproduction with non-sexual desire. Moreover, while the ability to breed gestures towards a heteronormative temporality oriented toward family units and capitalist production, it is quite queer in execution, revealing something about Minecraft's world that is rare for other reproductive stimulations. Sexual difference does not exist. To break that down, first we have to understand that there is no distinction in the animals of Minecraft that denotes gender. You could say that the two animals that breed and produce a baby are male and female, but there's nothing in the game that says that's the case. And so gender is completely absent in Minecraft's take on breeding. It's not even a consideration. In fact, breeding doesn't even need to, uh, isn't even a sexual act. All that's required for two animals to breed in the game is for them to be of the same species, to be near each other, and to receive their favorite food. This isn't heterosexual sex, and nor is it even really sex, yet it is a form of breeding as a child is produced at the end of it. Hence, we can say that Minecraft has a queer representation of breeding within its rules and systems. This should encourage us to analyze and rethink the systems that we hard code into games. It's so easy to design systems in the heteronormative way, as that's what we're used to. But one of the benefits of making video games is that we get to write the rules. We can deviate from the norm and should wield that as a power. Using video games as a space to explore, explore queerness from the ground up, starting with the code we write. What would our world look like if the rules that govern us are designed to cater to queer needs? 
the next one is a game called <coughs> Disco Elysium. And I'll be looking at how a couple of its designs reflect the queer experience. This is an RPG in which you play a cop who wakes up in a trashed motel room with a terrible headache and no trousers on. He doesn't remember what happened to get him in that state or even who he is, but he quickly discovers that he's got to try to solve a murder. You proceed to explore the city block and talk to the locals to find out what's going on. However, at the start of the game, you get to choose some skills and can unlock more throughout the game. And one of the ways you do this, uh, one of the ways they manifest in the game, sorry, is as voices inside the cop's head. They each have their own mad personality and will pipe up at certain times as bizarre thoughts or to encourage you towards doing certain actions. For example, one of the voices is called electrochemistry, which deals with the desire to drink alcohol and take drugs. It's a bit of an animal. Earlier in the game, there's a puddle of sticky alcohol, which electrochemistry spots and instantly tells you to lick it up like a street dog. Remember, this guy's a cop as well, so it's like extra shameful. Uh, you can choose not to do that, but electrochemistry will insist that you shouldn't think you're above such desperation, and will keep telling you to find a drink as quickly as possible. There are 24 skills in the game that represent the many facets of our thoughts, especially the ones we bury away. Uh, they also define the cop's capabilities, such as hand-eye coordination and creativity. Um. Disco Elysium lets you mix and match the skills so that with each playthrough you can approach the game's events and characters in wildly different ways. This range of possibility gives the game the bandwidth to embrace queer ideas and actions, which includes becoming part of the homosexual underground, but in this context it also includes queerness outside of sexuality, as simply something that deviates from and challenges the norm. That's why you can choose to buy speed off a 12-year-old kid rather than help him escape his abusive father. And during the autopsy of the murder victim, there's a chance you get to flick his dick around. Uh, the other game mechanic in Disco Elysium I want to point out is dice rolls. The success of any actions you try in the game are determined by a dice roll. This opens up a huge opportunity for failure, but failure isn't the end. In fact, it often leads to Disco Elysium's funniest and most memorable moments. To give you an example, you can try to slip away from a cafeteria without paying your bill. If you pass the dice roll, you'll run away as planned. If you fail, however, you'll get about halfway across the room before spinning around, leaping backwards towards the exit and raising middle fingers to the uh, manager. While doing this, you'll then sail into an old woman in a wheelchair and knock yourself unconscious. Um, don't worry, the old woman's fine. Uh, You'll probably fail many actions throughout Disco Elysium and encounter scenes like this all the time. The important thing to note is that most of the time, the game continues despite and sometimes because of your failure. It makes failure an integral part of the story, the game world and its characters shifting to accommodate your car crash of a playthrough. This is a very different approach to failure than most games, as failure is usually a game over, and we're forced to replay a moment and beat it in a specific way to proceed. Sometimes there's room for experimentation in how you succeed, but you still have to succeed regardless. Not so in Disco Elysium. It lets you be a failure and kind of makes it inevitable as you play disaster of a human being. One who has no money but has to pay rent on a room each night and who also has to solve a murder but can't even remember his own name. Disco Elysium transgresses the notion that we must succeed in order to exist. Society tells us that to fail will result in us becoming homeless and a person who deserves to be ignored. Disco Elysium, on the other hand, lets you give yourself the title Hobo Cop sleeping rough and rustling around in bins for coins, and you can actually beat the game that way. Failure might not seem inherently queer, though, but being queer means, in some regards, being a failure. Jack Halberstam argues this in his book, The Queer Art of Failure, the message of which is handily summed up by Leora Elias. She says that being queer is for those of us who fail, lose, get lost, forget, get angry, become unruly, disrupt the normative order of things, and exist and behave in the world in ways that are considered anti-normative, anti-capitalist, and anti-disciplinary. By being queer, you are predisposed to fail, at least within the society we live in, as it's not primarily designed for queer people, and it especially isn't set up for queer people to, uh, to succeed. But queer people don't give up when faced with this. They have the fight, and yes, they do fail. And some of us learn to embrace that failure. Trans journalist Juliet Jack says this happens when queer people figure out that success for them in this world is never going to be the same as it is for others. And so making failure into a style or even a way of life may bring far more positive results than the unquestioning pursuit of success. Queer people who embrace their failure reclaim it and turn it into a strength, wearing it as armor against those who would try to mock or hurt them. I think of the drag queen Monet Exchange, who was mocked for wearing a dress made entirely of sponges in RuPaul's Drag Race, and to be fair, it was pretty bad. Um, but she responded by turning sponges into her signature. She now has the catchphrase, the luck of the sponge, wears hideous sponge accessories and tells everyone, about, everyone how great they are. And it was also released a song called Soak It Up. 
But there's another side to queer failure, a much darker side, and Disco Elysium doesn't shy away from that either. There are moments when the cop dwells on how horrible he is, and you can have him tell other people about it, how much he hates himself. At one point, you can even have him threaten to kill himself in front of two young children. As the game's lead writer Robert Kurbitz told me, this is immensely uncool. It's a moment of immense weakness during which a man exposes his abject desperation, which is a result of the world being in agony from to exist in. Queer people live through these horrible moments of pain often, sometimes every day, and not all of us are able to be strong and get through them. It should come as no surprise that the group with the highest rate of suicide attempts is the queer youth. The rate is significantly higher than the general population. Queer adolescents are very likely to have depression, harm themselves, and many avoid healthcare for fear of being discriminated against. So being queer and embracing failure can be fun, playful, and strengthening, but it can also be miserable and deadly. The two sides are not inseparable, and they are always present for queer people. Disco Elysium can be seen as a game that reflects both sides of this queer experience of failure. Either way, it's a game that makes us overwhelmingly clear that the world is against you, and what it asks you to think about is who the world serves. And if it's not you, how are you supposed to survive? Uh, Disco Elysium may not necessarily come up with an answer for that question, but a game that possibly does is called Eugespiel, the Dog Opera. Pushing its bizarre title aside for now, Eugespiel is essentially a game about the difficulties of artistic labor and how those who are downtrodden, oppressed, and queer can repurpose the world to serve their purpose. The creator of the game, David Kaniger, doesn't just get this idea through, uh, across through the scenarios and dialogue in the game. In fact, it's much more embedded in how the game itself was made. Eugespiel was created almost entirely with pre-made assets. All the art, code, camera, movements, and uh, much more is the work of other people. David bought it all together. Oh, sorry, the, the, the people made it and they set it online in like these asset stores. Um, he bought it and assembled it into a game. There are even McDonald's fonts, characters from Zelda games, Donkey Kong as well, and a rendition of Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On to be found in there. Nothing original exists in Orchestra except the music that David created for it. Uh, this gives it a cheap look, what artist Everest Pipkin calls the asset store aesthetic. But that doesn't take away from the meaning behind it all. In fact, that is the meaning. Making Orchestrial this way, pulling together all these assets, subverts the norm and suggests an alternative way of making games. You don't have to learn how to code or how to create 3D art. You can make a game that is packed with meaning without all the production values that the mainstream demands. This is, this is a significant lesson that queer people usually learn as they go through life. Being set up to fail means finding new and unexpected strategies to navigate life. Queer people have unusual desires and must seek them out through unorthodox means. This means having to transgress boundaries and play with the rules. So if the many labor practices and economic laws aren't designed to serve you, you find ways around them. Can't afford the software you need to create game assets or you know, don't have the time to learn how to make them because you work a 12 hour job or something. Don't worry about it, just use ready-made assets and let your own creativity do the rest. Augustpiel is a game that doesn't feed the market. Its cheap look is a radical political act. One, one that queer people can follow up and should be inspired by. David Kaniger took a risk doing this, daring to make a game with a style that people often dismiss, but he used it to make a point and it paid off, as Augustville actually won the 2017 Indicate Grand Jury Prize. As queer artist Liz Ryerson said when accepting the award on behalf of David, it's a game that makes space for genuinely new and transformative experiences. It shows us that another world is possible. Queer artists don't need to conform to ideas of normality. In fact, they probably can't. So they need to rethink reality, repurpose resources, and infuse their art with ideas that speak to their queerness. That's why we need more, represent, uh, more representation in games. We need to go further and invent game design that's tailor-made to reflect queer experiences. We need more queer systems, queer mechanics, and queer frameworks. Representation so far has done well to acknowledge that queer people exist in the world, but it also needs to acknowledge that queer people will interact and behave in the world differently. That is queer design. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Great. Um, are there any games that helped you understand your queer experience? Any games that helped me understand my queer experience? Um, yes. Um, about 10 years ago, I don't know what this game was called, but someone made a small free game. Uh, it was about a pansexual character. And I had never come across the idea of what pansexuality was at the time. Um, by playing the game, I was like, okay, what the hell is that? And then I realized I am pansexual. Um, so that 
pretty much introduced me to that. I also, uh, I would also mention Assassin's Creed Odyssey and just the representation in that game. Um, it, it was nice just to be able to like flirt and have sex with everyone. That was pretty great. Any more questions? Hi there, my name is Bobby. Uh, so I'd like to ask if, okay, so I, I confess I did miss a little bit of this talk, um, <laughs> but when it comes to, let's say, online role-playing games and the ability to choose to play as a character whose gender is not your own, and where do you see this lying in terms of gender exploration, in terms of, especially with those like games where you can highly customize your character? Um, in my experience, uh, I haven't played, I think I play as a woman quite a lot of the time. I don't know why. But I know a lot of other people um, have found by playing, say, as a, a gender that's not their prescribed one at birth, have found that that is actually their gender. Um, I've known many cases of that. Some people just like, you know, the other, the, other, the other side of it is some men just like to look at women's asses all the time rather than a man's, so they play as a woman. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of queer representation, it, uh, it's very good, it's very healthy, and it helps people to find their identity, which I think is great. Any more questions? Um, having just played the, uh, the final season of The Walking Dead in which uh, you play a character in which you can have uh, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, depending on obviously the choices you make. Uh, do you believe that there is, or there should be a distinction between uh, characters that are written to be LGBTQ, you know, or obviously like where it's a choice? Like, do you believe there is a distinction in character writing? Do I sorry? Do I believe there's a distinction between when they're written as yeah, a queer so person? Yeah, written like. When it's not a choice for the, the player or the character. I think if you write a character that's queer and you're forcing that on people, I think it's great. I think it forces people to... I think forcing people to um, have to face queer people more, even if it's a character, is a good and healthy thing. People need to be challenged. And yeah, and then the other option is like to make it a choice. Uh, that's also great, and for obviously other reasons. Um, it is a, it's definitely a distinction. I think making people have to date or interact with a queer person is a much stronger and bolder choice. And I think more people should do it. Actually, I have a question. Oh, God. Go on. <laughs> I have no question. So, um, you show a slide uh, with uh, Dream Daddy. Yes. And what, I think one, one aspect I find very problematic with being a simulator is the fact that Basically, your goal is to get with those characters, <coughs> mm -hmm. with those character, you know, some kind of romance with them. And the fact that you can replay the game and basically have to select the right choice, in a way, you don't say what you want to say, you say what you need to say to get. Mm -hmm. It's so, gamified, yeah. right? Yeah. It's gamified. So <coughs> it's a, I feel this is a very tricky because where consent stands, if you can rewind time and say, at the time, you like to think without any. You know, yeah. Because it, it, it should be, you can either play once, <clears throat> or if you say something that is not real, that is not true, then there should be some consequences and mm -hmm. the reason. So, isn't queer on one side, but also problematical? I guess it depends on what your goal is. There are games I know from, <clears throat> I think there's a Flash game made several years ago that you could only play once unless you got a new computer. If you died in that game, I think it was called One Chance. <clears throat> if you died in that game, you couldn't play it again. That was it. Your chance was over. And like, I guess you could kind of do that. It, like, our reality is that's what happens. We only have one way through. We don't get to go back. You know, people may forgive you and stuff, but I think if you want to hit people with that reality, then yeah, for like, do that. I guess something like Dream Daddy is trying to be more playful and fun. The fact that it exists in the first place is quite fun. Um, I don't think it's the best dating simulator out there. It's just like it's a good. It makes for a good slide, right? But. Uh, yeah, I, I know it's, it's fun enough. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would agree that I would like to see more people challenge players in that way and make them have to live up with their choices that way. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, so thanks so much.